My name is John Busby. I'm the CMO of Centerfield. I'm really happy you're joining us today uh, for Connections, which is our B2B marketing summit presented by business.com and Business News Daily. Uh, B2B marketing and B2B sales, which I've done for more years than I, I probably want to admit, are, are some of the hardest nuts to crack. And, um, and I've pulled my hair out trying to accomplish big things in B2B marketing and sales a bunch of times. And then on top of everything, there's a pandemic. So today we're going to get to the, the, the bottom of, of that. Let's get started. So um, we, we, ask, we have a bunch of amazing speakers today. And in return for everyone's time, uh, we're making a donation to the charity of, of their speaker's choice. And here are all the charities uh, that we are donating to, some like uh, Mary's Place and Feeding America I have known about for some time. Some are new to me I got to read about um, and are really cool and special. So thanks uh, to all of our speakers today and uh, especially to Samantha. So uh, Samantha Stone, founder and author of the Marketing Advisory Network. Thanks for being here. How are you? And you chose the American Lung Association as your charity. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about why that charity is important to you? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for making the donation. What a wonderful way to, to thank us for our time. And um, we're just so, so happy to support all those wonderful charities that were up there. The American Lung Association is near and dear to, to my heart personally. I have um, a lung disease. I have asthma, which for many people is pretty moderate. Mine happens to be pretty significant, and I have to have a significant amount of um, medical intervention to to treat it. And they have every year a, a fight for a clean air climb in, in Boston and around the country. And I've just been um, super supportive of their efforts to raise money for research. But one of the other things that they do, which is why I particularly like them, is they raise awareness around the impact that air quality has on folks who have lung disease and also the increases in lung disease that it could potentially cause. And they happened this morning to just publish their latest annual report. And there's two data points in there that really summarize, you know, besides my selfish reason for wanting research in this area, why I really support them. And one is that 41% of Americans live in counties that have unhealthy levels of air pollution. That's a huge portion of the population, but it gets worse. And the worst part is that people of color are 61% more likely to breathe polluted air compared to folks who are white. And so not only is it a challenge overall for everyone, but it is also another area where we have discrepancy in populations. And so I am super appreciative of their efforts to surface information like this so that we can come up with ways to both treat um, lung disease, but also hopefully keep our air clean and help prevent exacerbating it. Thank, thanks for that, um, and thanks for thanks for sharing their latest research. So, okay, um, let's get into what what is on everyone's mind. You have a a consulting business that helps B two B marketers like me. What just to, to start us off? What what's the biggest change that you've seen for folks like me and what I'm going through since since the pandemic started? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, there is an unbelievable amount of change that's happened across every business and every life and everything. I I love that you're calling us from your attic. I happen to have a home office, so I'm super fortunate. But there's lots of happy noise outside as you know, kids are home from school and and all kinds of things that are happening. But the reality is that I think the most durable um, change that is consistently across every business, kind of no matter what what you do in B two B, is that we've shifted away from this notion of I'm creating an annual plan and I'm going to forecast what's going to um, come not just next week or next month, but really project in a great amount of detail what I'm going to be doing for the entirety of a year. And I actually think that's a good thing. We're starting to embrace um, more wholeheartedly because we had to um, more agile methodologies where what we're really doing is not trying to predict everything that might come, but we're building frameworks by which we can make decisions. 
And then those frameworks become the core of our plan. And we provide flexibility in how we budget. We provide flexibility in what resources are focusing on. We provide flexibility in um, the part of our segments and, and the community that we serve. And I'm um, that's a positive that's come out of the situation because it's something that we were inching towards for decades probably, but hadn't made that great leap. And I've seen a lot more organizations make the great leap to really embracing that kind of planning. Yeah, that that is a that is a positive thing, um, and I think that we've experienced some of that our, ourselves. On on the on the flip side, on the flip side, people don't don't call you and say, "Oh, I've got a bunch of great news to share <laughs> about how things are going." What what are folks what are folks struggling with right now? Yeah. Well, yeah. sometimes they call me with some great news, which I'm grateful for. But um, but for the most part, yeah. I mean, we're we're brought in when there is real challenges and great opportunities ahead to take advantage of it. And there are, are lots of things that we're all struggling with um, right now. This past year and a half almost for for some of us has been a really disruptive force in how we operate. And um, there's a number of things that have been a challenge. So one of the first and foremost things is we're used to communicating in B2B to people in their workplace. We had mailing addresses for people in their workplace. We have phone numbers for people in their workplace. Um, our rules about how we communicate to people and honor, you know, um, opt out lists and spam um, laws and th things shifted when all of a sudden a good portion of the people that we're communicating with are no longer physically in their office. So we've um, had to figure out how to adapt to that environment. We've also had to adapt to completely changing buying processes. So not only are we working from home and we're having to figure out how to interact with our buyers and our communities in different ways, but our salespeople are used to engaging people large with some in-person component. Now, a lot of us, are, most of our business is on the phone, but we're still used to face-to-face -face exchanges, whether it's at an event, whether it's for a big demo meeting. And our customers and our buyers are used to bringing their whole buying committee together, often in a room where they're looking at different vendors and they're building requirements and things. And that whole dynamic has you know, exploded. It's you know, completely disruptive. So how do we help salespeople be effective in a completely foreign medium to them? They're not, they're fundamentally not used to operating that way. And frankly, our buyers aren't used to holding their own interactions and evaluations and decisions the way they are. So how do we do that? And then the third big bucket of challenges is that our customers' businesses have been disrupted. And it's you know partly with COVID and health scares. It's been distribution um, uh, challenges and transportation challenges. They're not, um, their business may have been growing and accelerating out of urgent need for something that's COVID related. It may have decelerated and slowed down. But what we do know is things have changed. We also know there's a big cry for social justice and for brands to stand for more value is in our customers want to understand what we stand for and who we are, not just what we do. And um, we have an obligation to communicate those things off to customers. So understanding our buyers is always a hard thing that we have to do, right? But understanding uh, what has changed and the priorities that people might have now that were maybe different than were for those buyers six months ago or a year ago, maybe even three months ago. And that has been the big challenges that we as B2B organizations have to tackle and work to overcome. I love I love that answer and how you how you separated. I want to um, show you some some uh, some data points here in a minute for you to react to. But be, before I do, I want to dig in a little bit more on the on the in-person face to face. If if like an in-person or face to face presentation is the most personal that we can get and and like um, maybe an email is the most Im, impersonal. Is there is there a, a silver lining, I guess, in in video conferencing. I, I know that um, that I, I live in Seattle. Um, our corporate offices in LA and prior to the pandemic, most of what I did was was over the phone with folks in the LA office. Now, now uh, we're all talking in, you know, in person video over video and it's it's so much better than it was before. So is there is there a flip side dynamic as it pertains to the sales process? Um, or or not? 
Yeah, there's definitely yeah, there's benefit definitely. if you get it right. So one of the, certainly I think looking each other face to face and being people now sort of anticipating and expecting to have a video conversation versus just a phone conversation. Um, I think that's a benefit. I always think body language, facial expressions, you know, I happen to talk a lot with my hands, right? You can um, you can know a lot about um, what I'm delivering that way. So part of it's how we deliver. But probably most important is how we hear back from people watching their body language. What are they leaning into? Where are they slouching? When are they, you know, starting to listen in? When, you know, do they get that squint in their eye that looks, they look confused. Well, we need to know that. We can capture that in a video conference. And the advantage is, a lot of times we won't always have everybody who's involved in a room. Even if we got together in a room, we might not see everybody involved. So we sacrifice seeing them in their work environment and being in the same room together and grabbing lunch and, you know, shaking hands and all the benefits of that. But we expand the group of people that we may be able to reach and we take the burden off of just voice intonations picking up folks when we more actively embrace video. So I think there's um, good things that have come from um, doing this, but it's but it's not easy. The other um, thing that I've noticed is that there's a big shift in um, in the interaction expectations. Just like you're, we're coming to you in your home, our customers are inviting us into their home, right? They have people running around, they have pets you know, on their lap. And what a gift, like what a gift to be able to um, have that kind of intimate discussion with a B2B buyer. It shifts the dynamic and, and it allows us to build more emotional connections with people. That's why I love that you call this connections, right? Because that's really what this is all about. And it gives us an opportunity to do that, but we have to change and shift how we think, right? We Our guards have to be down. We have to be willing to share a little. We also have to be willing to work different hours. People are on odd schedules. They might have gone into the office at 8.30 in the morning and left at 6 o'clock at night. But now if they're working remotely, they're taking kids to school, they're taking a walk uh, to get some fresh air, they're going from call to call to call, they're taking a break to do laundry or make dinner or go grocery shopping or whatever those life things are. And so what we're seeing is a real shift in um, the hours that we are expected and our sales team is expected to be available to have conversations. Um, that can sometimes be difficult to balance, but it also gives us the ability to maybe have some downtime also and have flexibility in our own schedules. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a, a, a data point at you here. Um, so I, I don't I don't have any B2B marketing colleagues that say that they have more leads than they want or need. Um, but this, but this seems like this seems like an issue, where um, two thirds of of marketers are struggling to meet lead and pipeline objectives. This is right in the beginning of the year, February, when folks have just kind of just gotten out of a planning phase, perhaps. Um, let let's un, let's unpack this a little bit. What are you hearing from uh, from your clients, and 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 how do you react to this? Yeah, you know, this is a a really big and meaty um, and important thing for us to understand. And I think there's a number of factors that are contributing to this. So one of the factors that is contributing to this is that with the exception of a few industries, and there certainly are a few industries that have had an increased demand for their product or service as a result of this last year, most people have um, gone into some kind of tightening mode and they're a little bit um, more careful with their spend. So the sales cycles are taking longer. They're more competitive. There's more scrutiny. There's an extra buying approval layer that are in that. And as a result of that, to meet our financial goals and objectives, people want more stuff in. So the, the pressure to put more in um, is coming as a result of sort of the financial realities that are there. The second thing is it's just getting harder for people to read our emails and we can't, you know, we it's not as easy to send something to an office and it's harder to do outbound calling because we don't always have phone numbers for people, right? Not everybody's forwarding their phones. Um, and so there's this, some of the things that we did are, um, we, we can't do as well or they're less effective or they're harder to stand out. And then a third really big reality is um, a huge portion of marketing's dollars and investments and um, the resulting impact that it has was on in-person events. And in-person events has effectively 
um, gone away. Now it will reemerge. I really believe that there will be a, a hybrid feature for us, but for right now it's gone away. And so this thing that was very dependable that we could that we could create a, an urgent moment in time around um, uh, an event um, and all these conferences and trade shows we used to be very dependably around. They they didn't translate virtual well. The virtual trade show booth just didn't work. Um, and it, no no one has really cracked the nut on doing that. So do I believe in virtual experiences? Oh my goodness, I could spend a whole hour just talking about that. But the the transition from those staples has um, not been smooth. And so I think all of those things are coming to be. And to be honest with you, I actually think the 63% is under <laughs> under reporting. I actually think that that number is in fact probably higher. Um, that the pressure is on and that it is um, increasingly difficult to get through noise and, and clutter. And we have to work a little bit harder than we had to work before. For sure on that point. Um, you know, and, and we're going to hear in the in the breakout sessions coming up why why people decided to make purchase decisions. So kind of the other side of the the other side of the coin. But um, but as a as a marketer, I generally have a bunch of tools in my in my tool belt. I, I can I can talk about pricing. I can talk about ease of use or of, of implementation. I can give someone some research. I can offer up a case study. Um, are there any types of things in this environment that you feel like are moving things along faster or or working better? Yeah, that's a really yeah, good question. Really good. And I have to tell you, I actually have the bonus. So I do, of course, I'm a marketing consultant, so I work with lots of marketers. But a lot of my work is actually doing primary research with buyers and helping core organizations understand buyers. So I've also had the opportunity to interview many dozens <laughs> of different types of um, enterprise buyers and understand how their processes have shifted. There's no silver bullet, so let me just stop there. Anybody who's listening thinks I'm just going to give you the, the, the answer and you're kind of like, it doesn't exist. But what I can tell you is working better is um, uh, more personalized interactions and um, some of the relationship building types of things. So um, we've I've had some great success with um, what I what I consider sort of fun, um, high fun indexed relationship events like wine tasting and cooking classes and even roundtable discussions that have a um, content topic, but we um, have the right kind of MC and the right kind of guest speakers and we and we have some fun. So, you know, really creating intimacy is is working very well. I think the block and tackle ABM tactics that people were doing before COVID um, are actually working very well now because they're focused and targeted and personalized to an organization and a buyer. So going more in on those types of things has been very effective. And then I've had some um, some folks really work hard at, uh, like Jay Bear calls them talk triggers, but word of mouth types of things. How do I create something that gets people talking, not necessarily about what I do, but who we are and, you know, sort of help spread the word that way. And when we're all tense and we're all kind of exhausted of the last year of all of our lives, um, if you can, you know, tap into that and create a, a, a fun, it doesn't even have to be fun, but a wow moment. It could just be awe-inspiring or it could be um it just an incredible experience that you create for some people talk about those things because they want and need them now more more than ever. So I think all of that is um, really um, is really starting to have an impact and is helping. Um, one of my favorite little companies they do. Um, they're not so little anymore, so I shouldn't say that they're actually getting larger and larger all the time. But Sweet Fish Media, they do podcast productions for um, organizations. And um, I was talking to them about some some work and they sent me the best proposal I have ever received. It had video inserted in it and it was fun and it was completely on brand for them. But I felt like they were talking to me because they were talking to me. Um, and I expect us to see more and more of those types of things happen where we have this moment of pause. We have money that used to be spent on things that um, needs to be reallocated and we can experiment and and play with these ideas and really ramp up that kind of outreach. And I'm I'm very excited to see organizations um, starting to see some benefits of doing that. 
You know, one of the th- uh, themes I think I'm I'm hearing is personalization, intimacy, personal connections are still an, uh, an uh, incredibly important part of the sales process. Um, and, uh, you know, I was kind of prepared to ask you a bunch more about re- research. And it's obviously still super, um, super important, but, but we can't, we can't kind of forget that thing that worked really well in the, in the quote unquote real world. Um, this half an hour has flown by. So I'm going to have to rapid fire you a couple questions. Um, and, and to the, to the audience, if you have questions for Samantha, fire them up, um, now if you want me to be able to, to get to them. So, um, you talked about, intimacy with um uh with 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 clients or prospects or or whatever uh, but a big theme in in your book is kind of about like internal collaboration or intimacy among sales and marketing um have you seen any dy- dynamics change um cha- change in the last 12 months and any any tips either for sales folks or or marketing folks yeah that's an excellent yeah, that's an question, excellent question. one of this one works of this works in marketing is aligned around, around the buyer, around the buyer. Around the buyer. And so I've certainly seen um, two, a couple things that have happened that I've observed in the teams that I get a, the honor of working with. One thing that I've seen is um, sales is, um, with the exception of those rare instances where there's a product that's in higher demand, um, sales is struggling. And so when they struggle, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to be grumpier and more demanding or they're going to be more open to trying things. And I have luckily seen more openness. And so I've seen sales team really um, leaning on marketing for help and advice. How do you make me a better writer? I've got to reach out to people in writing because I'm making fewer phone call connections. How do I do that? Help me do that. What? Um, how can I contribute to um, you know, making a virtual experience a great one. Um, and so there's just, there's this spirit and motivation of being willing and able to be in, we're, we're all in this, when things get hard, you either fight each other or you're in it together. And luckily and gratefully, I've seen more, we're in this together. And I think that that is um, wonderful. I've also seen a little bit of, um, one of the things that's been a challenge is salespeople often be like they're bouncers, right? They're like, you can't talk to my customer. Don't talk to them. You will screw up my deal. I don't want you to talk to them, right? But marketers have to talk to customers and we have to talk to buyers. That's how we get better at what we do. It's how we capture stories and all those things. And I've seen that guard come down a little bit. And I've and part of that's because some of it's virtual and they can participate in the process. Sometimes it's just a willingness to say, hey, I know we got to try new things. So let's try new things together. And and trusting each other more. And there's also just, you know, we're inviting each other into our home, just like we're inviting customers into our home. So we're all in this together. We've all had this shared experience and shared experiences creates friendships. And even though these are business and professional relationships, friendships sort of as the the core of the bond that connects us together. And so in most cases, we're seeing increased collaboration forced by need. Um, And my hope is that that will sustain even after things perhaps get back to something that feels more like normal. I I love that. Um, And that could be a great note to end us on. But I want to ask ask you um, one one last question. Maybe that's the the obligatory. What's what's the if you haven't covered it yet? What's the main piece of advice you give to B2B marketers before we head to the breakout sessions? The first thing is. Um, if you want to change the outcomes, the single most important thing to do is change what you measure. So making sure that we're measuring the right types of things um, is absolutely critical. And we have to be measuring the things that are the impact on the business. So that's number one. Number two is something that may be less obvious, but is um, this huge opportunity you have right now, and that marketers are incredibly good at automating. We have a, a ton of different kinds of technologies at our disposal. We have all different kinds of ways of interacting. That provides scale, and that's amazing and valuable, and I love it. But, and this is a really big but, um, we have stopped doing things that can't be automated or scaled, but that doesn't mean those things are not valuable and important. And now more than ever, this is an opportunity for us to look for manual intervention points or partially um, automated, so manually triggered intervention points that will provide a, what feels like a really intimate experience with the people that we're trying to serve. And um, we overlook those all the time. We get in a room, we brainstorm, and we say, we can't do that because I don't have a systematic way of doing it. Or, well, that would take me spot checking data and, and we can't do that. We can do that. 
We just have to make the decision to do that. And it's really um, critical and important that we as B2B marketers don't lose sight. So if you do those two things, you change what you measure and you don't rule out great ideas because they can't be scaled, you'll see some pretty remarkable um, bounce backs and some pretty remarkable new successes and new relationships with buyers. Thanks, Samantha. That was awesome. Um, hey, everyone, if you want to get in touch with uh, Samantha, we have um, her her website um, uh, on on the Excel events events page, um, or or check her out. Go to directly to her website or read her book Unleash Possible. We've got a number of copies of it that we'll be sending to some of you. Um, and uh, and also, last thing, we will see you at the breakout sessions. Thanks, Samantha. Thank you so Thank much you for so having me. This is great. Okay. All right. See everybody in the breakouts.